<laughs> all right, thank you all. We're going to kind of get started here. We're going to continue with the Andy Reeser uh, yeah. session. And he's got money to give away. And uh, and I, I I think before we start, I'm probably going to say something silly, but uh, that's I want to do that. Uh, we we're involved at Green Township and jurisdiction I represent has is doing one of the pilot projects. We're wrapping it up on final funding and uh, it, it is, especially on the EV cha charging component, I mean, there's a market element that's out there. Then there's going to be this public um, pursuit and public uh, process. And um, it is a little bit unusual. It is a little outside of our box. So um, we, we're we only doing one dual um, charging station at, at, a, at our headquarters facility or our main administration building. Um, but I think it is a learning experience, and I think as jurisdictions take these uh, projects on and they become a little bit more um, obvious to folks, and I think the benefits will ultimately be, be you know, down the line, as Travis and, uh, you know, kind of mentioned today, where, you know, it's on our radar screen regionally. Um, it does take a little bit of kind of wading through the process, but I would encourage communities to go ahead and make the application because I think it's a very valuable um, project and I think it's worth worth uh, pursuing and the money apparently is there. So with that, Andy. Yeah, I am leading off again. Uh, so welcome to the workshop. We're going to discuss the application process for OKI's capital funds. We have several presenters here today to describe our process, answer your questions and help you submit the best application possible for your projects. So let me start by Talking about round two of our electric vehicle charging infrastructure project using our carbon reduction funds. And this is for Ohio only. Uh, as you recall from the ICC meeting, we're about out of money for Kentucky. So this would be Ohio only. And it's for projects ready to go to construction in either fiscal year 25 or 26. So quick turnaround here. So with this round, there are several notable changes to the program. Uh, as I said, only applications for Ohio. Um, in Indiana, OKI no longer has access to capital funds, including carbon reduction funding. Uh, we've increased the maximum number of applications per LPA to five. And third, we are utilizing toll revenue credits as match, meaning awarded projects will be 100% uh, with no local match required. So this is a uh, limited time only. So get it while you can. And uh, we're hoping to get a lot of applications and big applications. Um, so let's start with our program synopsis. So even with uh, round one concluding, we still have uh, close to 13 million available. Uh, in Ohio, again, 1 million will be the maximum per application, but you can submit, submit up to five. So each location is a different application. And this is uh, funding a current as of as of today. So the uh, OKI program, just like round one, round two, it's just it's just for the installation of publicly accessible electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, the focus is on DC fast charging equipment, and we hope we have a lot of applications for DC fast chargers. Uh, but we also will consider level two charging, which is the uh, uh, lower tier, tier, the slower chargers. And you must have the commitment to operate and ma maintain the EV charging infrastructure uh, for at least five years. So eligible applicants. Uh, just like our other funding programs, uh, the eligible applicants listed here, although ODOT, ODOT for the electric vehicle charging, the ODOT does prefer applicants have experience with the local let process. Uh, it's not a deal killer, but that's what they've told us is that that's their preference. So carbon reduction program parameters, like I said, one application per site, no local match. Uh, federal funds are capped upon award. Uh, so there's no 10% uh, additional funds or anything like that. It's capped at what the award is when we do the OKI board resolution. Uh, once you do get the award, it's subject to competitive bid process and ODOT's oversight and a reimbursement arrangement, just like our other uh, federal funds. So a little bit more on toll credits. 
this is allowing you to do the 100% uh, federal with no local match. So by improving and maintaining the Ohio Turnpike, ODOT has accumulated these toll credits that are suballocated to the MPOs. So this is our first four-way four way here into uh, using some of these toll credits and applying to projects. So again, they can be used as non-federal share for many projects, making it 100% federal. But this also means that OKI uses more federal funds for every project. So a little bit about the scoring process, a total of 55 points are available, a total of 15 points for project description, uh, and you need to discuss five items. Uh, one, the type and quantity of charging port ports, two, amenities and vehicle accessibility, three, potential users of the site, four, site preparation needed, and five, as far as project description, we want you to describe how you're going to maintain the site and your network plan for uh, providing uh, the data to us. Uh, sufficient network capacity is a simple yes, no, and you need to pro provide a brief statement from your utility provider. Uh, proximity to Justice 40 communities awards up to five points, and we have a map uh, to help you with that. And planning factors, our Environmental Justice Committee will uh, evaluate these projects at their meeting uh, in the summer, probably July. Other scoring factors, uh, distance to the nearest DC fast charger can score up to 10 points if you're installing a DC fast charger. Uh, no points if you're installing level two chargers. ADT, that awards up to 10 points for high volume corridors. And then renewable energy supply scores up to 10 points if a project's uh, based on a project's ability to utilize renewable energy. And then history of project delivery looks at the applicant's recent history of delivering OKI funded projects. If there are one or more projects in OKI's tip that have missed a construction year, there, a penalty will be applied. Just some resources for you as you go through the application. A uh, map of Justice 40 communities is available at this link. And then uh, ADT, you can utilize traffic.oki.org where we have uh, traffic counts for many of the many of the roads throughout our region. And then uh, we recommend plug share to know where the nearest DC fast charger is and you can do, do distance and everything from that tool. And it, our uh, application for the carbon reduction program consists of five sections, the application information, the cost estimate, uh, certifications, um, evaluation factors, planning factors, and then the application guidance document is available on our funding website. And uh, the application has a similar look and feel to our other applications for the other funds, but it's much more stream slimmed down. So. It uh, should be easier for you to to complete. So the CRP schedule, we're having this announcement and workshop today. Uh, we're going to follow the same schedule as the other funding programs with applications due on June the 7th. That's the first Friday in June by 4 p.m. Uh, it will be reviewed by our Envir Environmental Justice Committee in July and will come to the ICC in September. Uh, after being uh, draft scores by staff and the Environmental Justice Committee that will come here to ICC. And then ICC approval in October with board approval also in October, and then included in the tip shortly after that. That's all I have on CRP. Any questions on that before we continue? Yes, Steve. I don't know if you can this today or not, but uh, the applicants that are eligible through ODOT, do those include special districts like a park district? You know, I mean, I, I talked Great Parks, Hamilton County, had a project with ODOT in the past. I don't know. Yeah, um, you know, like I said, they prefer local let uh, experience. Uh, some park districts have that experience. Metro Parks in Butler County, Great Parks do. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking if it's other than that, they're going to need to partner with. With a local, yeah, the city or. Uh, County. Larger township or county, yeah. Yeah, you have to be you have to be local let certified. You have to be able to, to trigger in your we can't do this without let. Okay. We have to do it local let. The question I mean, for example, in our community, our park district isn't part of the government. Oh, it's you have to okay. 
sign an LPA agreement with ODOT. Okay, right. I don't mind doing that. I mean, there's only five for five maximum applications. That's what I was kind of getting at. Yeah, it would count toward one of your applications. Yeah, any anyone you're signing on to. And again, it's, it all comes down to whether you're eligible to sign contracts with ODOT. What kind of support infrastructure is it covered? Need to add a parking spot or something? Is that Parking spot, we haven't encountered that that before. Uh, lighting. Anything yeah. that has to do with safety, um, uh, restriping of the parking lot. Yeah, you probably want to have these spaces be a little bit wider to that, that sort of thing. Other questions on carbon reduction funds? Okay. Long line of uh, presenters here. Bob is up next. All right, uh, good to see everyone again today. Thanks for coming. Uh, those of you who are new to the process, I'll try not to use too much jargon, uh, but I invariably will fall into that trap. So if you have yep. questions, feel free to stop me, just raise your hand. Uh, last yeah. month we, uh, we shared with the ICC and they concurred with a, a few changes that we have for this year's process compared to last. Um, you see on the screen, STD, STBG transportation factors for roadway projects. Uh, we're moving to a more sophisticated approach with determining the value, using the value of freight rather than just a plain old percent truck. Uh, the status, this is uh, similar for all the project types. We used to have, uh, did not have uh, a situation where if we had a, an application from a, an applicant we had already awarded money to, if they come back for an additional um, uh, amount of money beyond the 10%, we, we force them into reapplying. In this case, uh, we wouldn't give them any points in the status uh, for that uh, situation. And then bike pad um, safety kind of change on the approach using the total number of crashes over five years versus the average, it's just to simplify it so everyone, no one's confused on how to, to go about doing that. Uh, complete streets, we increased the score from five to 10 points. Uh, to accommodate that change, we reduced feasibility from 10 to five points, and then status is the same as it was uh, previously mentioned. Moving on to TA transportation factors. Remember, we're talking about today the STBG, the SNK, and the TA. Uh, this is just for the TA. We're replacing uh, a scoring element in there that we called consistency with the OKI Metropolitan Transportation Plan with uh, something we call network component, uh, regional, part of the regional system on down to not part of any network from 10 to zero points, just to make that a little bit more uh, objective rather than subjective. Planning factors, um, local match, we had kind of anomaly, we were, <laughs> We were giving a point to applicants who came in with 21%. Instead of that, we're going to raise that uh, in order to get at least one extra point. Uh, you have to provide 25% match rather than the typical standard 20% match. Let's just talk about CRP for this year. So that's another story. Uh, local planning, we had some uh, point values for communities who have their uh, comprehensive plans that are up to date and rewards project sponsors that have um, current plans in place. Okay, this is just kind of for next year. We we mentioned the fact that where some of our projects are way behind schedule and next year we will not award new funding to any applicant who has that has three or more OKI funded projects that have slipped past their program year. It's just a few, but um, we want to try to do better, and you have a whole year's head, head start to get those things taken care of. All right, now back to the more traditional part of the presentation where we talk about uh, different components, how you apply, what are the elements, so on and so forth. Uh, here are the list of typically eligible applicants, uh, add districts, cities, counties, townships, transit authorities, port authorities, 
TIDs, other units, and then as as Andy mentioned, uh, basically the litmus test is can you sign a contract with ODOT or KYTC? Yes, Wade. Slide, well, just curious, um, how long is that in effect? Is that until the projects are out the door? Yes. Everyone hear that? that? His question was, is that in effect until all the until the project is out the door? Basically until the uh, project is is obligated and you kind of get released from that temporary injunction, I guess. <laughs> the date of when that obligation is. Or September 1st. Thanks. OK, basic project eligibility. Projects are in or are consistent with the 2050 plan. For STBG, uh, we require that the projects be located in the urbanized boundary or urban area boundary. That's now the more common phrase used. Uh, TA can be uh, anywhere in the region in the OKI planning area. Roadway projects must be on a functionally classified route. Uh, meaning that we cannot fund projects on local streets. Uh, applicant, applicant must provide the local match, unless you're talking the CRP program for this year in Ohio. Uh, and recall that the program is a reimbursement process, meaning you have to front the money in most cases and then uh, get reimbursed later from the state DOTs after you can uh, demonstrate that the bills have been paid. Uh, maximum two applications per LPA for Ohio SDBG, Kentucky SNK, and then for TA, a maximum of one per LPA. This is a uh, map that shows the OKI region. The different colors are different urban areas in the region uh, where I mentioned that we would allow for other than Indiana, but I, I didn't want to break them off. Um, but in Ohio and Kentucky, anything in the colored area. And this is uh, technically a draft of the adjusted urban boundary, but uh, we don't expect any changes because we've worked closely with those state DOTs to get to this point. Um, officially needs to be adopted by headquarters at both FTA and Federal Highway, but um, we thought we'd move forward. If you go back to the 2020 census, it's just, it gets real messy, so we're going to move forward rather than look backwards. Okay, okay. here's um, the matrix of the funds we have, how much we have, et cetera, et cetera. So we have Ohio STBG. Where can you spend that? Again, that's in the urban area. What can you spend it on? Right away services, right away utility construction. We have $28 million for this year. Maximum funding request is $8 million, and each applicant LPA could ask for up to two. For TA, again, it's anywhere in our planning area. In Ohio, right away services, right away, utility and construction, 3.6 million. Max amount, 1 million federal. Uh, on the Kentucky side, SNK, the urban area, we do allow uh, money for design work, right away services, right away, utility and construction. We have only 7 million available. And the maximum amount is 6.5. So we can in the one big project or however many of smaller projects come in, you can ask for up to two, make up the two applications. And uh, on the TA side, we have uh, two and a half million dollars and the max amount is 650,000. Yes. So are you saying if a uh, entity like some of these Boone County as an example gets Project S and K funds. Project has to lie within that green area. Yeah. I don't remember the color, but yes, in the green area. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pause there. Any questions? All right, good. Typical project types. Uh, STBG is pretty flexible. SNK, same thing, basically. And you see different project types, and they're they're listed there. 
in years when we do have CMAC uh, in Ohio, we try to mix and match to optimize the program. Those that are red asterisks, uh, generally speaking, can also be eligible for CMAC. But since we don't have it this year, I won't dwell on that. But it's a wide range of projects, uh, roadway, bicycle, transit, intermodal, so on and so forth. But that's the beauty of SDBG, flexibility. And it's typically the largest amount. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, the next few minutes will be about the STBG prioritization process. And for those who of you who've been here before, you know that we have, this is kind of a two-part thing. One is the modal side and the other is the planning factor side. You score each mode independently and then you bring it back, add in the planning factors that all that pertain to all projects and then uh, come up with a total. And then that's where we start with basically what we can afford to fund and what we don't fund. Okay, so first for roadway projects, and we have a lot to cover, so I'm not going to read all these, but uh, it's basically anything you can imagine. And we've tried to make our application both complete, useful, um, but not overly difficult. You know, this is not the raised grant where it's, you know, 45 pages and there's a 20, 12 page benefit cost analysis, so on and so forth. Um, many of these uh, measures are objective, and so they have, you know, repeatable processes and data that we can lean on. A few of them are subjective, uh, like impact on safety. We do have, based on evidence of uh, crash reductions, but it still has a measure of subjectivity. Um, AET is an objective measure, so on and so forth. So. Um, there you see the metrics, transportation factors for roadway projects. Each of those worth five points. Now, in the go back, there is a, a line item here for complete streets, uh, and it's worth, um, that should say 10 points. Uh, but we know that every roadway cannot be, cannot accommodate every mode, and we don't expect that to be the case. But we want to make sure that if there is an op opportunity to make a street more complete, that our applicants take the opportunity to investigate that. And if you're not trying to make a street complete, then we need you to list why you're not doing it. And I think we've been very accommodating on and reasonable. And you see the seven exceptions there, and there may even be more if um, Certain, under certain situations, but anyway, we don't expect you to, you know, tear down homes and so forth just so you can fit in a seven-foot sidewalk versus no sidewalk. It's just you know, let's be reasonable about things. Uh, we don't expect the cost to be absorbed more than twenty percent. We we think that's disproportionate. And then you see the other things there: low-volume roadways. There's no need to have a side path on a street that has 100 vehicles a day you know stuff like that let's just try to be reasonable but in other situations it makes a lot of sense to make the investment downtown situations and, and so on and so forth so um you know i don't know if i'm gonna try to do this or not but i guess i will uh, our project application assistant is a nice tool and you'll be expected to use this for your roadway projects and Basically, the eligible roadways that All right, well, we'll, we'll skip that. Most of you have been through the PAA. Got to be like Gumby, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, the PAA is basically an interactive a tool that ties back our GIS system to data sets that can be used in this process. And it's easy enough to use. You have to type in a few things and then 
basically you just go click on the roadway section where your project is and it extracts the underlying data. And um, we'll expect you to use that. And it's also a useful tool for uh, other aspects of your work life uh, as far as you can find the functional class, you can find that urbanized area map, you can find the existing transit um, service, you can find uh, environmental justice areas. So it's it's good for a lot of things. You can get traffic information, crash safety information, so on and so forth. So uh, all good stuff. Uh, let's move on to from roadway to transit. We have, um, I guess the, the the message here as you read through those is that we we favor projects that increase ridership and projects that are regional in nature. And um, so there's only five categories, and you see them all there, and they're easy to identify. So transit side of things. Next element is bike ped. Uh, like roadway, there are more, few more factors, uh, safety, impact on safety, network connections, feasibility, existing surface conditions, complete streets again, and project status. So some of these are similar to the roadway. Some are just specifically associated with the, the bike bed modes. One of the big things that we look for in multi-use trails or other bicycle pedestrian projects are how do they try tie into the network? We are a regional agency. You know, we 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 can't live in the world of small neighborhood stuff. You guys, that's your job. But when you come to to us, we're looking for connections. I, there's a there's a system here that can we build the system out further and bigger and better. Uh, that's one of the key things that we're looking for. And then of course. In this mode, complete streets is a significant element, and uh, two are the highest scoring components of the bike bed. Um, we have a, a category for transportation factors for non roadway freight, and the big hitter there is uh, large trucks removed from roadways to improve traffic flow and reduce congestion. That's the big hitter here, it's worth 20 points. And the other things have to do with specific modal traffic flow, congestion reliability, status of the projects, so on and so forth. I think that's it for me. I'm going to ask Andy to come back up and continue with the discussion, starting with planning factors. What Bob was talking about was mode specific factors. And I'm going to talk about the factors that apply to all the projects. So we'll start with air quality cost effectiveness factor. Um, <clears throat> it relates to our continued efforts to improve air quality in the region and encourage more environmentally friendly forms of fuel use. A uh, project may receive points if it contributes to a reduction in vehicle miles traveled or VMT, vehicle hours traveled, or results in cleaner vehicle emissions. Uh, project elements that have historically uh, been evaluated as producing larger emission reductions per dollar invested will receive more points. So often we get, you know, we get like 40 applications. So we're not going to run all, all those through our model. We're going to look at a guide to help us uh, find the most cost effective projects. And it's largely based on a federal highway EPA study of nationwide CMAC projects. And results of that study have been modified to include a more diverse range of project elements as we might expect with a call for STBG projects. Uh, project categories will be mic uh, categorized in the strong, mixed, weak, or no impact, and the scoring values are reflected in Appendix B of the application. So that's what Appendix Thanks. B will look like. And uh, again, um, this is kind of the range. So idle reduction or uh, replacing uh, diesel buses, that kind of thing will score the highest. Uh, if it's just a sidewalk or something, we'll score lower. And things su such as uh, just simple maintenance projects will receive zero points under this factor. The next, next factor is the intermodal elements factor. 
It awards up to five points for projects that involve new interactions or direct connections between modes. Examples of this are such things as new or direct connections between barge and rail facilities, uh, new roadway access to a port, or a new pedestrian uh, accommodations to access transit. Uh, replacement, replacement features are not award awarded points under this element. Uh, this, this is an example of a new connection between two modes, barge and rail. It would score three points. And another um, example of a new connection between modes. Uh, in this example, a project adds a new sidewalk as a new connection between two modes and would score three, three points. Or instead of a sidewalk, if it's the project is adding a multi-use path, it is now a connection between three modes, bike, walk, and transit, and would score five points. Replacement and expansion factor gives preference to projects that invest in replacement rather than new facilities, uh, reflecting the priorities in our Metropolitan Transportation Plan to maintain what currently exists before investing in new infrastructure. Uh, the points associated with this criterion take into account that some expansion projects involve a certain amount of replacement. Uh, the points are awarded based on the percentage of replacement versus percentage of expansion associated with the project. Then for local share or match, up to 10 points can be earned in this category. Uh, you can get 10 points with a 50% match. Uh, the standard match is 20%, which would only score, would not score anything, would score zero points. And the scale at 20 point, 20% would score zero, 25% to 29% would score one point. 30 to 34 percent match would score two points, 35 to 39, four points, 40 to 44, six points, 44, 45 to 49, eight points, and then finally 50 percent or above, you would get the full 10 points. Uh, technology also is a 10 point factor. We continue to look for opportunities to invest in the advancement of transportation technology. Uh, some examples are in the guidance document. Uh, projects that have received technology points in the past include fiber optic installation, advanced traffic controllers, electric buses, and trail counters. And history of project delivery. Um, if applicants are behind schedule, uh, they can get uh, minus points under this factor. Um, so an applicant who has had one OKI funded project slip to a later year would be penalized minus three points. An applicant who has had two or more projects slip to a later year will be penalized five points. And if you have one or more projects canceled, it would be 10 points. And again, yeah. that's a snapshot in time. We look at it September 1st, right before we uh, prepare uh, to come to the ICC in September and uh, look okay. at looking at projects in the active tip at that time. And uh, I'll be quiet for a little while and let someone else talk for a little while. Florence Parker is going to come up and talk about the environmental justice factor. You want to come up? I've got a question. I have oh, a question. You. Yes, Mary. This is for the projects you were just talking about that are late. You know how there's a penalty of, for one project, three points, for two, five, and for three, ten. Uh -huh. And then that's if you're behind schedule. Um, if you have three projects that are behind, uh, that aren't obligated yet, I guess that's you, you can't apply. So how did those two? Well, that's only going to be next time. That was a warning from Bob saying next time around, if you have more than two, three or more, then okay. we're not going to even look at your application. But this so, round, we're not going to worry about that. OK, well, we worry about it, but you're still getting scored. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Bob Morris, want to come up and talk about environmental justice? Thanks, Andy. Good morning and once again, welcome. One of the questions on the application form ask if your project will impact an environmental justice community. Individuals living in such communities are sometimes referred to as being members of traditionally underserved population groups. 
The basis for this planning factor on our application is the title is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which states that any program or activity that receives uh, federal financial assistance must use those funds fairly and without discrimination. In addition to minority and low income communities, we here at OKI also include communities with a high percentage of uh, elderly persons, zero car households, and people, folks with disabilities. A community has been so designated if the population for any of these five population groups meets or exceeds 50% of the regional average and has more than 250 individuals. Keep in mind that an impact doesn't always have to infer something of a negative nature. An impact can also have a direct or indirect benefit. And if there is a negative impact, it may be temporary, not permanent. As Bob mentioned earlier, take advantage of our project application assistant. It'll help you to identify the location of EJ population groups near or adjacent to your project site. However, if you're still uncertain, you aren't sure about the location of your project site, then check with us. Use us as a resource. That's what we're here for. And help make that application process a little easier for you and your staff. Here on this slide are a few examples of potential impacts during the course of your project. Relocations, lane closures, on-street parking restrictions, closing part or all of a public walk, sidewalk or expressway, to name a few. And don't forget to uh, that uh, when you have that uh, Public, those public involvement meetings. Don't forget the questions raised are concerns raised by residents during your public involvement efforts in the community where your project will be located. And speaking of public involvement, even though COVID-19, that virus altered, has altered our lifestyle somewhat, the method of outreach to the greater community has been enhanced. In addition to the traditional in-person public meetings, the method of uh, reaching folks uh, goes beyond just that physical location. The public can now usually check on Facebook or participate in virtual or Zoom meetings to learn about a project in their area. Some of the examples here on the monitor could be viewed as being negative, but if you address them early, it'll pay big dividends. Attend community council and board of commissioner meetings to share information and answer questions. Be flexible. If you have to post signs, are you aware of the ethnicity of the individuals who live, work, pray, or play in the neighborhood? In some areas of our eight county region, those signs should be in English and Spanish. That way, most individuals who travel to the area will know about the changes in advance and can plan accordingly. Also remember to increase the size of the print on the, si on the signs so that those signs are easier to read. I don't know any of the inner workings of their public involvement, a public information campaign, but for me, ODOT has done a great job reminding the public about the upcoming Norwood Lateral Project. I live in Pleasant Ridge, and recently electronic signs have reminded me of the upcoming project every time I take the ramp off of Ridge Road to get onto the lateral. One of my friends has a catering business and started asking me about the project some time ago. She lives in Paddock Hills and uses the lateral to get to the Hyde Park, Oakley, O'Brien areas to do her shopping for her catering clients. 
As I received press releases from ODOT, I would share that information with her. Also, have you noticed the number of news stories, both print and electronic, about the lane restric restrictions and lane closures for the project? Remember my remarks earlier about your po project's potential impact on an EJ community? Well, this project impacts all five of OKI's EJ communities, as well as the greater community and, of course, the business community, since folks who live, work, play, or pray in or near Amwood Place, St. Bernard, Bond Hill, North Avondale, Avondale, Norwood, or Pleasant Ridge must rethink their travel route or add additional travel time during this construction. Now, that could certainly be considered a negative for the project, but ODOT started reminding us early, and we know the inconvenience isn't permanent because some of the electronic signs are even counting down the days to completion. He gave that question on environmental justice serious consideration because even though I serve as support staff to our Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, it's the members of that committee who review and score your answer to the EJ question. Also remember that the number of points that you can earn for the EJ question, it has increased from five to 10 points, but I think I did hear this morning that for the carbon reduction program, you can earn up to five points. Whatever, please don't leave that answer blank, especially since we have our project application assistant available for your use. Now, if you determine that your project really doesn't impact any of the EJ population groups during any portion of your construction schedule, Use the EJ question as an opportunity to highlight the many positive benefits of your project. Remember, our goal here at OKI is to always ensure that the investments we commit to transportation improvements don't cause undue hardship on any of our residents, but especially residents living in communities that represent any of our five EJ population groups. So mitigate when and where necessary, but also communicate with the host community for your project, starting with day one of your project. Thanks for your time. Good luck with your applications. And I hope some of this information has been helpful. Does anyone have any questions? Lawrence, I have a comment. If you could yeah. go back one slide, I noticed I left a word off. Very important word. Go back <clears throat> further. Go back uh, right there. Go to the 50%. Actually, the definition of environmental justice is 50% above the regional average, not 50% of the regional average. So uh, that makes a big difference. Sorry about that. That's it. Any questions or concerns? Thanks a lot. Good luck. Hey, good morning. I'm Travis Miller. I'm going to be reviewing three of the planning factors uh, that you'll be um, completing in the application. Uh, first of which is economic vitality. Uh, this is worth up to 10 points. You could, you could. You could get up to 10 points uh, on this factor. Uh, five of those points uh, you don't have to worry about. That's something that OKI staff will calculate, uh, essentially determines the number or calculates the number of uh, jobs that are within a half mile um, over of your project. Uh, so the more jobs that it's serving is catalyst for the, uh, the points you receive there. Uh, what is up to you is a five bonus points here. So if there are additional uh, new employment, jobs that, that are associated not with construction, these would be permanent jobs, but if there is a, a new industry or a new, uh, new employer uh, that's reliant on the project that uh, you're asking funding for, uh, provide us the, the statistics on that, the number of jobs that that employer will have. Uh, you can get up to five points. There's a scale 
uh, that's in the application based on the number of jobs determines the number of points up to five for that. Uh, also, part of this bonus is is new investment. Uh, so uh, any new investment in terms of uh, commercial or industrial or any uh, development that's coming in, increasing the tax base, uh, that investment can uh, can gain you uh, points here if, in fact, your project is the catalyst for that investment to occur. Uh, and that scale is based on the value of that property, that new investment that's coming in, that new development. Um, and those numbers and, and thresholds are, are within the application. I'll lift a bug here for me. All down. Sorry. All right, now I know where I'm supposed to supposed to hit. Uh, off and running. Uh, the second um, uh, factor that I'm covering is strategic the strategic regional policy plan. If you're not familiar with this plan, please uh, spend some time at www.howdowegrow.org. Uh, this is a, a supplemental plan to the long range transportation plan and really focuses on the relationship between land use and transportation. Uh, so the more that your project recognizes its relationship with the surrounding land uses and benefits and potential opportunities, uh, the better it's going to score under this category. Uh, specifically, we are looking for projects that um, are either located within or will enhance a mix of land uses projects that uh, help to stimulate reinvestment in brownfield areas uh, or even grayfield properties, um, you would receive points. Projects that go beyond the state or local requirements for stormwater management. Um, so if you're incorporating green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, again, beyond what is already required of, of the state agencies, um, you'll get strategic regional policy points um, uh, for that. So give us a description. Uh, let us know what's uh, what's included in your design and how that goes beyond um, the, the minimum requirements. And then projects that are located along uh, major collectors or higher roadways uh, that are consistent with uh, the transect categories that are here in this, uh, this graphic. There's a link in your application to take you to for reference, uh, but we use this as a guide just looking at the density, the intensity of land use. Uh, that your project is within or is supporting, uh, and the more intense that is, the likelihood of you getting the additional points uh, are. And then finally, uh, the local planning uh, factor. Uh, this is tied to local comprehensive plans. So the more consistent your project is with a local comprehensive plan, a current comprehensive plan, uh, you can get up to five points. So if your project is listed or referenced in a local comprehensive plan and that plan is less than five years old, you get the full five points. Uh, if your project is consistent with the plan but not specifically referenced, uh, you would get four points. So an example of that would be if it's a sidewalk project uh, along a roadway, and the comprehensive plan uh, generally encourages uh, more connectivity and pedestrian uh, uh, enhancements and pedestrian connectivity across the community and you're doing a sidewalk project, your project would be consistent uh, even if the project isn't specifically listed in that plan. So that would be four points, not five. If your plan said that uh, pedestrian improvements along Main Street uh, is a goal of the local community, then that's included in the plan and would get five points. This is a change from last year on the point, so I just wanna make sure that's clear. Uh, if your project is uh, within or consistent with a plan that's more than five years old, uh, that's that's two points. Uh, so really encouraging communities, as we always have, to keep their comprehensive plans up to date. Five years is the threshold that we use uh, to, to determine the currency uh, of a plan. Uh, so again, if you have a plan, but it's older than five years uh, and you're consistent with that plan, two points is what you'll yield on this, point, on this, uh, this factor. If your project is inconsistent with the plan, which happens occasionally, uh, if it's inconsistent with the plan or if there's no plan uh, in the community, then zero points. We get the question often, uh, what is a comprehensive plan? Does it have to be titled that? No, not necessarily. Lots of communities approach comprehensive planning and their land use planning differently. Um, so sub area plans, 
um, you know, any plan that um, includes the ingredients of a comprehensive plan. And the primary right. ingredient that we're looking for is community engagement. So if this is a plan that's been adopted by a community and the community has been engaged in that process, uh, if it's not a full comprehensive plan, a, you know, a sub area of your community or a corridor study, uh, things of that nature, we do consider that um, and, and we'll point to provide scores as if it were a comprehensive plan. Uh, so we try not to get into the semantics of that and try to be reasonable in terms of what the intention of the plan and what the study is. But again, those the community engagement is the primary ingredient that, uh, that we're looking for. Uh, another point uh, that I would make here is maintenance projects uh, automatically qualify. So if this is a resurfacing project or signalization that's not adding capacity to uh, a roadway, uh, the planning points uh, automatically apply because of the uh, um, built in uh, nature to support uh, our existing infrastructure. So yeah, beyond on those points. Any questions on any of those categories? Great, thank you. If not, then I'm going to turn it over to Summer. Guys, we're in the now. Uh, I just want to give a little refresher on the TA funds. They are very similar to the SDBG SNK funds that you have heard uh, about, but I do just want to point out a couple differences. TA funds do not have to be located in the urban area. Um, they do not have to be on a functionally classified roadway. And nonprofits can apply, but they will eventually need to sign an MOU with a partner that can sign a contract with um, the Department of Transportation. And um, of course, our funding limits in Ohio is 1 million, and in Kentucky, the maximum is 650,000. And each LPA can apply for one TA project. Um, these TA funds can be used for on and off road pedestrian and bicycle facilities, infrastructure projects for improving non drive access to public transportation and enhanced mobility. Just like with STBG, we rank all the projects on the five TA factors that are worth a total of 45 points. And then we add them to the planning factors that were the same as the STBG SNK, which are 55 points, and the total project uh, score is 100 points. There are five TA infrastructure factors. Um, as you can see here, project type, very simple, worth 10 points. What is the project? Is it a sidewalk? Is it um, lighting? Is it a multi-use path? Safety, as Bob mentioned, we did change this. Um, it's um, the total of number of crashes over five years. It's no longer the average. And network components is new. We uh, made that similar to STBG. It used to be um, if it was consistent with the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Now we um, have changed that to network components. If it's a regional network trail, you do receive the most points, which is 10. Connections, um, projects must be transportation related, which means they must connect to logical termini. It cannot be a recreational trail. Um, project status, same as STBG, where are you in the stage of the process? And just like um, with STBG, you will receive a zero if it's a subsequent, subsequent request for a previously awarded project. Um, these are the trails that we consider to be um, regional network trails, the Great Miami River Trail, Little Miami, Lunkin, Mill Creek, Greenway, Ohio River Trail, Wasson Way, and Riverfront Commons. So we do consider these to be regional network trails and they will be worth 10 points. Here are the planning factors, same as the STBG. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them again. Um, but they are they are exactly the same as STBG. This is our air quality cost effectiveness chart. This is different um, than the STBG because these are only TA related projects. Um, they are worth five points and you can see here um, that they go down in scale depending on what your project is.
The application is an Excel based application. Hopefully you guys are all familiar with it. Um, there's really been nothing new added. Um, it's going to ask for your contact information, your project name, your description, the primary goal. Um, we want you to be as concise as possible. We, we want you to just put it in that little box we give you. Don't <laughs> don't go on and on and on and on. Um, we really want you to be concise in the description and the primary goal of the project. And then you will need to have a cost estimate. Um, each phase will need to have a cost estimate and each phase will need a local match. You will need the certifications um, and then it will be ranked on the transportation factors and the planning factors and then the attachments, which will be a map of your area and a certified cost estimate. Now, I do have to warn you, we can only receive files up to 35 um, MBs, so be careful what you send. Some people send really big, large maps, and they don't need to be that large. Um, if you can condense it down and really just focus in on your area and your project location. So with that in mind, also pay attention to your separate file sizes because there are several things you have to upload. And there is some guidance on the application that does give a recommended file size. So like your um, map or your cost estimate, but all of those cannot go over 35. And if you have any questions when you're uploading any of these, um, please feel free to call Andy or myself and we will help you figure it all out. So here's the schedule, uh, March 12th, we're right here today um, for the workshop. Applications are due June 7th at 4 p.m. Sometime in the summer, probably July, the Environmental Justice Committee um, will meet, review, and score your applications. We will take the applications and the draft scores to ICC in September. We have a, another date of the 17th set aside if needed. In the past, we haven't, so knock on wood, we won't again this year. We'll come back to ICC for approval in October and then um, that same week for board approval, and it will be included in the OKI tip in the spring of 2025. And again, yeah. remember that these are fiscal year 28 funds. <clears throat> If you have any questions during this process, please do not hesitate to reach out to any staff, anyone that you've heard here today, talk about any of the elements, or if you're not sure who to reach out to, you can contact myself or Andy, or for the CRP grant, you can reach Andy um, or David Shuey. And I see a couple of you taking pictures um, on, this will all be posted online on our website. Um, so yeah, I just, I encourage you to reach out to us if you have any questions throughout the process. We're always here to help. Are there any questions? I know it's been a lot. So I'm if I could mention, when you open the application, which is just a spreadsheet, there's a direct link in that application to the PAA. And that also has some features that allow you to copy and paste data back in from the PAA into the, to the uh, application itself. So try to make it um, as easy as possible. And again, that all falls back into the file size. So just keep all of that in mind when you're uploading stuff. And send us good maps that don't take five minutes to load, please. <laughs> um, I, it varies by applicant, but last year there were some that were, I don't remember the format, but when you went to download it, because I really like looking at maps, but they, they can't take five minutes to load. I don't know what the deal was. Uh, so regular JPEGs and those kind of things work pretty well. And a uh, video of this workshop will be posted on the website as well. Uh, if you go to OKI.org and click on transportation and then funding, you'll be able to find everything, a guidance document for each programs, the application, uh, video of this workshop and the PowerPoint for this workshop will all be there. Thank you all for coming today. Um, it's supposed to be beautiful, so get out there and enjoy the nice weather. Thank you. Uh, uh, I hear you.